All right. Uh, I am back with Scott Ritter. Uh, after a year, uh, Scott and I talked last year when the Russia-Ukraine war was starting, uh, and we kind of took on this question of will um, will Ukraine be another Afghanistan for Russia? That was our that was our touch. You know, that was our takeoff point. And uh, we kind of uh, you concluded probably not, um, and uh, and for various we 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 kind of broke the analogy between Ukraine and Afghanistan in various ways. But it's been a year, and I wanted to to uh, you know ask you back. So thanks for coming back, Scott. And there's a lot to talk about in terms of analyzing what happened in the past year. But the first thing that I wanted to ask you was basically one of the one of the facts of this past year has been the incredible intensity of every fact is disputed so it is almost impossible to tell who's even winning or losing so if you if you talk about if you talk to anybody who's listening to canadian or us media daily they actually believe that ukraine is winning and that Russia is losing, Russia's on the verge of collapse, etc. And you have been saying, you know, very confidently for the past year, and even before that Russia is winning, and Russia uh, is doing just fine. And they, um, so, you know, I guess, how somebody here is wrong. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I trust your sincerity. So I have my suspicions that about which side is lying here. Uh, but like, if you if you don't know you and you don't know your work and you don't know who to trust, how would you go about trying to figure out who's actually winning and who and what is actually happening? How do you how do how do we understand this question? How do we approach this question of what is actually happening with this war? Well, there's there, there's two ways you can uh, you can approach this. One is what I would call the, the layman way, um, the, the non-expert. Um, and this requires you to you know, dig into um, the motivations of each side um, and then dig into the, 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 the history of, um, of accuracy, not, not about casualties, but in general, you know, do they have a track record of being consistent with the truth? Do they have a track record of um, of consistency of uh, of their argument, et cetera? Um, and and so I don't, you know, I'm not going to sit here and write a PhD thesis on uh, on breaking that down, but I'll just come up with you know s some basic things. The thematic out of Ukraine and the United States and Europe is that this was an unprovoked war of aggression initiated by Russia. Um, missing in that entire argument is any discussion of uh, Minsk uh, in the history of negotiations there, uh, any discussion of the Russian um, effort to um, come up with a treaty vehicle to avoid war, the two draft treaties they submitted on December 17th of 2021, and frankly speaking, any, um, any discussion of phase one of the Russian special military operation. Can I just I, can I just jump in because I, I was listening to Chomsky and he said some really interesting stuff about this word unprovoked because he said, you know, you'll never see the word unprovoked about any other war. But if you search <laughs> unprovoked uh, war on Ukraine, you get like thousands of hits, and which tells you which tells you. something. <laughs> yeah. And he also said he did just the other thing he said is he said, you know, you can hate Russia as much as you want. You can argue about whether it was justified. You can argue whether it was legitimate, but you can't argue that it was unprovoked. Uh, he was like, it was provoked. Well, you I, know, I, I yeah. agree. I agree 100 percent with him on uh, on that. Uh, you know, and, and I mean, and I didn't even throw in uh, NATO expansion and the history of um, of warnings that came from the United States about the consequences of NATO expansion. I didn't throw in 2014, the coup, Victoria Newland's role and what was the true objectives of that. I mean, there's just a whole bunch of stuff that is there that is no longer there when people say unprovoked war of aggression. It just comes down to 
basically they start, I think, on February 21st, or around there when Vladimir Putin gave his initial speech, which people said, that's historical revisionism. This is a madman. This is a guy who's trying to reinvent history. Uh, he's trying to commit genocide against the Ukrainians. And boom, on 24th of February, the troops go across the border. And there it is, an unprovoked war of aggression carried out by a madman uh, who is guilty of historical revisionism. And that's that's the theme, and they've been consistent throughout. But as we gather data and we start to plug things in, we find out that, lo and behold, um, what people were calling historical revisionism on the part of Putin uh, actually is a heck of a lot more factually based than the counter arguments being put out by others. Stepan Bandera was an evil man. Uh, Banderism is a uh, ideology that is manifest today and a significant factor in the uh, Ukrainian government. Um, they have made him a national hero. They do have statues to him. They do sing songs in praise of him. They have transformed the entire youth movement of Ukraine to be in the image of Bandera and his hateful ideology. Yeah, Suddenly sure. you're sitting there going, wow, uh, Putin might have a point, but we're not allowed to say that because this was an unprovoked war of aggression. Right. Uh, but the you know the the thing that has escaped most analysts' uh, point of view because a lot of the Bandera stuff. I mean, I I have very good friends who I plan on staying good friends with. But if we got down this path and we and we went down, we wouldn't be friends because when I hear them say, um, "Look, Bandera, you know, the the atrocities he committed were against the Soviets. He's a Ukrainian nationalist who was compelled to do bad things uh, to defend Ukraine from." the evils of Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union. Therefore, mass murder is okay. And I'm like, no, it's not okay. It wasn't yeah. good. Stalin did it, and it's not good when Hitler did it, and it's not good when Bandera does it. Mass murder is never a good thing. But even if you take that off the equation, um, we have to go to the intent of Russia. Yeah. If you're going to carry out an unprovoked act of aggression and you initiate your military operation in a manner which is designed to compel your opponent to get to the peace table as soon as possible and, and complete a peace agreement as soon as possible, you have to ask yourself, why? Why is that your motive? If this was an unprovoked war of aggression, why are you seeking to, seeking to swamp the army, to capture the capital, to execute the leadership? Why are you preserving the leadership, preserving critical infrastructure, preserving everything that otherwise would be taken off the map? And you have to question now what is the intent. And the intent of Russia appears to have been, we know it is now the case, to get the Ukrainians to the negotiating table to come to a rapid conclusion of this conflict, because that's consistent yeah. with yeah. Russia's history over an eight-year period for a peaceful resolution to this problem. So right so, off the bat, go ahead. This is good because this is now getting into uh kind of what I was what I wanted to do with you uh in this in this recording, which is go through kind of chronologically what happened this year. So in the background, we have that revolution in 2014, which was yep. strongly supported by the US in which the, uh, you know, you they call themselves Ukrainian nationalists, uh, Banderites. Um, uh, you know, I think I think there's a case to to <laughs> call them Nazis. Um, <laughs> And and they played a pr prominent role. And there's there's admissions right from people like uh, one of these guys, Yevhen something, Yevhen Karas, explained. You know, we have fun killing, we have fun fighting. You know, nationalists were the key factor in the 2014 Maidan revolution. Yeah. And and they said, you know, he he kind of dismissed the idea that they were numerically not important. He said, you know, if there's yeah, okay, there was only eight, we were only 8%, but we were much more effective than the rest. If not for the nationalists, then the whole thing would have turned into a gay parade. Uh, well, he also so. is quite clear that um, it, it's not the total numbers. It's the yeah. percentage of your numbers that are willing to commit acts of violence in support exactly. of their cause. And when you have the right sector working for Svoboda, who gangs up, is empowered by the government to work with the Ministry of Interior to form street gangs, whose job is to intimidate, beat up, and otherwise terrorize a population, uh, it doesn't matter that when you go to the poll, only eight, you know, people, only eight percent of the population votes for you. When you turn your numbers yeah. into one hundred percent of the intimidation, yeah. you are in control of Ukraine. And anybody who doesn't believe that the right sector is 
not in control of Ukraine. And I'm talking about every aspect of Ukraine. There's not a single Ukrainian out there who isn't intimidated by the right sector. That's yeah, Z- uh, maybe uh, arguably Zelensky himself. He has there, been threatened with his life. Yeah, there are videos. If you find Minsk, you will be hung by the neck until dead on the streets of Kiev. Yeah. Now, in the United States, if I threaten an American president like that, I get visited by the Secret Service. You would never, so. never be seen again. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so d- the so then the war starts in uh, Donbass in eastern Ukraine, where there's a huge number. Well, the war of doesn't Russian start. It, it, right. Again, that, that's. Uh, I mean, that's, I mean, right. Shortly after 2014, uh, this is. Again, really, yeah. yeah. that, that implies what happened was the right sector began terrorizing yeah. the yeah. ethnic Russian people. That's not a war. Yeah. This is terrorism. And, and they, a lot and of the. Russia, yeah. They and rise lot, up. Yes. To preserve their communities, preserve their lives, preserve their way of living. And then the Ukrainian government, which is not the Ukrainian government, is the right sector dominated coup government calls all the Russians who are defending their lives, their livelihood, and their way of life terrorists, and they enact anti-terrorism legislation, which unleashes the Ukrainian army on the Russians. Yeah. Again, we're not talking war yet. We're talking about a government terrorizing a one a specific way. segment yeah. of the population. And these are Ukrainians. You, we're, we're calling them Russians, but they're Russian-speaking Ethnic Ukrainians. Ethnic Russians, but they're Ukrainian yeah. citizens. And they, and they uh, you know, they, they made a... They, I, I, you know, I think you could argue it was after some time that they kind of went the separatist route. Uh, they, they originally, I think, wanted to stay. They, you know, it was the they viewed of... themselves as the only legitimate patriots. See, they yeah. viewed themselves as Ukrainian citizens who supported the constitutionally elected president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych. Yeah, uh, they were not in support of this illegal revolution, this illegal coup d'etat supported by outside powers and empowered by a minority Bandarist ideology. Yeah. Um, so any any concept that this was Russia coming in, generating trouble to try and get the Russian, ethnic Russians to separate is just absolute horse hockey. Yeah, it doesn't uh, fit. It doesn't seem to fit the chronology. Yeah. So, so then that's like what's going on locally in 2014. But then in the big picture, I think there's something else that happened that leads to what's happening today, which is, I think, and you, I, you know, tell me if you agree, but it seems to me that at some point in the past, I don't know, 10 or 15 years, Russia's military industrial complex either caught up to or surpassed what the U.S., uh, could do so. There's there's a feeling that Russia doesn't have to just have these things imposed on it anymore by the U.S. Right. Look, the, the Russia of the 1990s was a basket case. Yeah. Uh, the post-Soviet uh, Russian space was, uh, especially from the military standpoint, was just an absolute travesty from a Russian perspective. Yeah. Uh, the, mortality the, the, mortality goes way up. Beyond, well, from you the, know. the man, the, yeah, your your life expectancy of your average man drops significantly. Alcoholism is rampant. Family units are falling apart. The yeah. whole country is disintegrating. Uh, the economy is an absolute shambles, being exploited by uh, Western capitalist interests who come in and use the oligarch class to ex- to extract wealth and then remove it from Russia, not reinvesting it into Russia. And it is just a downward trend. It's literally out of control. And the West is doing nothing to stop it. Throw that on top of that. You have conflicts such as the one that took place in Chechnya. Um, mm-hmm. You have other conflicts on the borders, uh, the Georgian conflict in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Uh, you have conflicts in, uh, in, in Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, mm-hmm. So you basically, you're looking at a, a, you know, a, a landmass that is disintegrating politically. Uh, and is dissolving economically. And you superimpose on that a military structure. And remember, it's not just the infantry, the army. We're talking about nuclear yeah. Uh, yeah. nuclear yeah. forces. We're talking about submarines with ballistic missiles. We're talking about road mobile missiles. We're talking about missiles and silos. We're talking about nuclear weapons that go on bombers. The whole enterprise is there. And the Russians went into, you know how when a body gets shocked, um, yeah, how, how, how it automatically starts concentrating blood where it needs to be. 
you know, around the heart, around the brain, around the critical organs, and everything else just goes into shock. Well, that was what happened to Russia and the military. The military concentrated resources where it had to, to survive. Um, but it, that wasn't in the um, rank and file military. And we saw this when in 1993, I believe, um, or 94, early 94, when the Russians went into Grozny and the initial uh, regiment that went in there was literally cut off and slaughtered by the uh, by a very a couple hundred Chechen rebels. We're not talking about well-organized. We're not talking about well-trained. We're just saying that this this group of Chechens destroyed a Russian regiment. There's um, a there's a military uh, question in there, actually, because um, I read somewhere that 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 kind of lesson of, you know, making hay for the for the capital and kind of waving the flag and then getting surrounded and destroyed was something they have not repeated. And it's also maybe helps explain how slow their advance has been in, in Ukraine as well, where they they're very sensitive to getting surrounded and destroyed or like overreaching their their lines. I mean, I, I think that the the Russian army of today is uh, is casually averse. Yeah. Now we say that, and 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 um, we have to also recognize that this war, Russia has suffered, um, you know, more dead in this conflict than they suffered in ten years in Afghanistan. Um, you know, they're getting close to uh, suffering. Uh, the amount of dead that uh, the United States suffered in 10 years in Vietnam. So I don't want to pretend that there's no Russians dying. They're dying in droves. This is a bloody war, the scope and scale of which nobody in the West could begin to comprehend. And that's not my words. That's the words of General Cavoli, the uh, the head of uh, the U.S. Army in Europe and uh, the uh, Allied forces. He spoke in Sweden in January, and he basically said that. He said, what's going on there, we couldn't even imagine. Uh, we were not trained for it, equipped for it, ready to fight it. Uh, we're going to get there, he thinks. I don't think so. Uh, but, you know, he, he was just like, well, how do you even begin to comprehend a, a war where the daily are the minimum daily shells being fired by Russia is 20,000? Uh, and that's sort of the annual expectation of, uh, of, 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 of this uh, during the entire desert storm, the United States fired 60,000 rounds for the entire desert storm. The, the Russians sometimes fire 60 to 80,000 in one day. And I gather if you're if you're anywhere near one of these shells landing, it's like PTSD for life. Like it shakes your brain and your head. And Well, it ain't yeah. good. Um, yeah. But we'll get into that because now we get into probability of kill and then probability of casualty, probability right. of effect. Um and how we calculate casualties. But you asked a question, a military question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even though the Russians recognized they had a problem in Chechnya, they didn't have the resources to uh, rapidly right. resolve it. Um, and, um, you know, and, and they fought a very bloody, um, ineffective war, uh, the first Chechen war. Um, then they had a second Chechen war, and uh, it, they, they got a little bit better, but still it was very difficult. From 1999 to 2005, it was very difficult for the Russians. They they started to transition into what they call contract soldiers because they recognized that um, the the conscripts uh, just weren't up to the task. They weren't trained enough, and you know the whole way of two year conscripts is just uh, self defeating because the second year conscript beats the hell out of the first year conscript who learns that. So when they become second year conscripts, they beat the hell, and it just happens. and And it, it's just a bad way of doing business. So they they transition to contract soldiers. Uh, more of a professional force, and the second uh, Chechen war was won because primarily because of contract soldiers, uh, people and that who, presumably uh, some kind of relationship with Kadyrov, and the and they managed to win over the political, uh, yeah. the political aspect, the heart and mind. But Kadyrov didn't come over uh, until he realized he wasn't going to win. Uh, <laughs> once it became clear that the Russian army was there, meant business, and you weren't going to prevail, um, suddenly you you know you can have your you know. Uh, your 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 bright light going off, going. Oh, if I continue to do this, I'm going to die. And um, and then you begin to second guess why you're doing it. You also have to get into who's what, who's helping you, and why are they helping you? Why is the CIA working with you against Russia? Is the CIA doing it because they like you, or are they doing it because you're accomplishing something for them? And suddenly you realize you're on the wrong side, and you switch over, and suddenly. The hearts and minds have been won and the war's over. And 
that was a good thing. 2005 and 2008, though, was to me the big wake up call. Right. Because what happened in 2008 is that Russia fought a very short war with Georgia. But the Georgian infantry, especially, had been trained by the United States Marines, actually. And um, they, I mean, you, you can, it's not me saying this. I mean, I'm a Marine. I'm very proud of uh, the combat capabilities of my uh, brother Marines, brother and sister Marines. But um, it's the Russians themselves who said the small unit tactics used by the Georgians were outstanding. Uh, the way they fired, the way they maneuvered, the way they provided support, the way they communicated, it was echelons above what we could do. Uh, we won because we came in with mass. We won because we could just blow them off the face of the earth with artillery. They didn't have good fire support. They didn't know how to employ their armor. But from the at the small unit level, the Georgians outclassed the Russians night and day, and the Russians admit it. They were like, holy cow, if we had to go up against a NATO force where everybody's trained to that level on across the board, we would lose, and we would lose dramatically. And so that's the, sort of the wake-up call for the Russians that went, we have to rethink this whole thing. And from 2008 until 2014, they, the Russians got in the business of, first of all, re-equipping soldiers. To be, to be an effective soldier, you have to have uniforms that are up to the task. You have to have body armor. You have to have communications devices that enable you to communicate weapons that are effective. Um, and so they, if you take a look at the Russian soldiers fighting in 2008, and, uh, and they're pretty much kitted out like your average Soviet soldier in Chechnya and Afghanistan provi or earlier. And you look at the little green men that were running around uh, Crimea in 2014, totally different, completely different people. Uh, the uniforms are different. The whole method of operating is different because they were learning. They were getting better. And, um, but they weren't done there because in 2014 and 2016, uh, they said, you know, we, we, if we're going to be fighting NATO, we need to bring back these formations like the First Guard, First Guards Tank Army and the 20th Combined Arms Army and bring them back. And, you know, we have to start looking at tanks. We have to start looking at artillery, uh, not to fight small wars, but big wars. And they started reorganizing. And when you do that, your defense industry has to kick in. See, from 2008 to 2014, the defense industry was focused on what I would call the 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 small stuff. But starting in 2016, it became the big stuff. Tanks, and, artillery. And probably uh, thinking of Ukraine. I mean, ultimately, by then, you know, they would have known this NATO. was going to be the direction. I mean, Syria, too. Uh, you know, they have some... No, some Syria... Syria small uh, for them. Syria was a sideshow. They did well. But Syria wasn't like Afghanistan to us. To us, Afghanistan... Uh, you know, it elevated uh, U.S. Central Command into the central decision-making body for all of the military. Everything from recruiting to equipping to training was all focused on low-intensity conflict. Syria doesn't drive the Russian uh, military uh, that way. It's, it's a sideshow where units adapt to Syria, but Syria doesn't force the entire Soviet or Russian army to adapt to it. Yeah, and so it seems to me Russia is, is preparing a long time thinking of Ukraine, uh, thinking of NATO coming through Ukraine. I mean, basically- yes. Starting is, in 2014, that was yeah. the, that became clear. Uh, and, the reason why they took Crimea was to keep it from falling in the hands of NATO, uh, <laughs> keep it out of, out of Ukrainian hands. And but, you've already uh, mentioned uh, the initial phase of the war. I think we can, we can safely move into the, the February, you know, the first couple of months where, um, you know, again, you were saying, uh, they're making these big moves and, and it makes the, you know, what makes the most sense is that Ukraine is going to probably have to surrender. And, uh, and then something happened and Ukraine just didn't give up. And, you know, the U S told them, we think probably the U S told them the, the Boris Johnson went by the time Boris Johnson went, probably they had already decided they weren't going to negotiate, but like these big moves where they threatened Kiev and everything were, probably trying to get uh, Kiev to to go back to the deal that they had, right? The Minsk agreements. and, and Well, it would be beyond Minsk uh, because, uh, uh, you know, we, Minsk was about keeping Donbass as part of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately for the Ukrainians, when they uh, decided they didn't want to play the game, um, yeah. and, you know, for Russia to go to war in Ukraine, and, and people need to respect this about Russia. Um, 
you can say they're manipulating um, you know, legal arguments, but the bottom line is they are assiduous about international law. Yeah. And so, and they're assiduous about domestic law. The Russian president cannot order the Russian army into foreign territory without yeah. the permission of the Duma. Um, and the Duma is constitutionally prohibited from ordering Russian troops to invade other countries without just cause. And the Donbas was Ukrainian. Now, an interesting thing, you know, just a, an aside, uh, a lot of people are talking about Wagner right now. Yes. Wagner, uh, part of the private military contractor, Wagner this, Wagner that. Well, Oh, they recruit prisoners, criminals. Well, they, they recruit uh, people who are going to accomplish the mission. <laughs> and prisoners, uh, when given a chance for redemption through fire, uh, become very enthusiastic fighters mm. uh, and they're cheap. So, you know, but they don't do that anymore. They, they stopped doing that because I think there was a lot of they controversy weren't. about that. Yeah, they were. Plus, they weren't. Uh, the problem with prisoners is that many of them are, there's a reason why they were prisoners. Yeah. And you, um, you, you, you don't necessarily get redemption by fire that you're looking for. You learn how to fight and you use those skills to exact revenge on other people and things. Mm. So I think they shut that thing down. But uh, Wagner was created because the Russian military, well, you know, as the separatists became separatists in 2014, 2015, um, they started to organize uh, to take yes. on the military, but they, they're still lacking certain skill sets. They, they're receiving uh, equipment from the Russians, old T-64 tanks and things of that nature, but they... You know, they, they have a limited amount of manpower that can operate this stuff. And so, but the Russian military is prohibited constitutionally from coming over and supporting them. So what would happen is they created the Russian, Prigozhin might take exception to this, but that's his business. Um, my understanding is that the Russian general staff. Are you suggesting that the Wagner group is not a completely independent uh institution with no and, and right, the wagner groups works for the russian general <laughs> staff and only for the russian general staff it doesn't work for anybody else but the russian general staff and the russian general staff um got Prigozhin to create an alternative um an alternate funding mechanism right. outside of that which is mandated by the uh, duma for the russian military because again they believe in the rule of law you can't and so they set up this mechanism and um, Wagner was created. Wagner initially had a lot of what we call sheep dipping going on. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's say you're the eighth um, armored brigade of the Russian army. Um, but then suddenly all your guys sign documents that get out of the Russian army. Right. They sign documents that give them a short term contract with Wagner. And then they hop into the same tanks and they go storming into Ukraine um, to fight the Ukrainian army. Is this a little bit like Blackwater in Iraq? No, Blackwater no. is near, Wagner is orders of echelons uh, better than anything, okay. better than Blackwater. Blackwater was okay, but yeah. Blackwater uh, had very limited scope. Blackwater was never designed to be a uh, armored brigade. Right. Blackwater right. was never designed to carry out uh, shock assaults in an urban environment. Blackwater didn't have its own artillery. Uh, they, while they did have some helicopters, they never had their own air force. When was the last time we saw a Blackwater guy running around with an F-15? Um, it's always Wagner the has all of this yeah. because that's what you need to fight a war. So Wagner is the Russian military, but it's a contract vehicle that constitutionally allows the military to operate on the soil of, uh, of, of the Donbass, of, of Donetsk and Lugansk. And they're very effective, uh, so effective that in 2014, they surrounded 10,000 Ukrainian troops in a village north of the city of Donetsk, and they were going to wipe them off the face of the earth. This is why we got the Minsk agreements. We got the Minsk agreements because the Ukrainian government, we're about to lose our army, they said. So uh, how do we prevent this? And Germany and France went, we'll, we'll step in and we'll get a ceasefire. And they twisted Putin's arm who, because Putin doesn't want a war. Anybody who says this is something Russia wanted doesn't understand Russia. The last thing Russia wanted was a conflict in Donbass. Uh, it was thrust upon them. Putin in 2005, again, people forget that, you know, there's a there's a CIA analyst out there who I like a lot. He's a good friend of mine, um, Ray McGovern. 
and oh, yeah. uh, Ray's an old Soviet analyst. For, I mean, old, he's so old that he predates the Soviet analyst division of the CIA. He was there before Sova. Um, but Ray uh, he taught me something very important. He said, if you want to know what Soviets and Russians are thinking, listen. Right. Just listen and, to him. Because Instead of listening to what the experts say. Don't listen to interpretations. Don't listen to this. Listen to them because they tend to say what they mean and mean what they say. And right. Putin in 2005 gave a speech to the Russian Federal Assembly, uh, and it's been widely misquoted. It's the speech where he said the great one of the greatest uh, tragedies of the last century was the collapse of the Soviet Union. It's been turned into the greatest tragedy of the last century was the collapse of the Soviet Union, full stop. And everybody says Putin is a madman. He wants to come back and return to the Soviet Union. If you think Vladimir Putin wants to return to the Soviet Union, you don't know anything about Vladimir Putin. Yeah. And the, But the most important thing is what he said after that, because overnight, tens of millions of Russians became homeless. Orphaned, yeah. He is the Russian president. And he is responsible for the Russian nation. And the Russian nation is not defined by the borders of the Russian Federation. The Russian nation is defined by the Russian people. And the Russian people are defined by their ethnicity, their religion, their culture, and their language. Mm -hmm. So when you have a large number of Russians, not Russian citizens, but Russians in Donbass, being attacked by Ukrainian nationalists who view them as subhuman, who have a track record. Again, this escapes most people. A lot of people might be familiar with Volin, the massacre in Volin, 1943-1944, where the Ukrainian nationalists under Stepan Bandera uh, slaughtered 110,000 Poles, mainly women and children and old men. And they slaughtered them in the most horrible way possible. We don't know, need to get into it. Use your imagination. But what a lot of people don't focus on is uh, the over 200,000 Russian citizens that were slaughtered by the Banderas from 1945 to 1953, when uh, Ukraine After, was, yeah. a, was, a, was a wild, wild west where these bands were running around, they'd surround villages, slaughter everybody. The Russians have documented, they have it all there, but people tend to forget about it. They don't want to hear about that. Well, the Russians haven't forgotten. And the Russians mm -hmm. know that the Banderas view them as subhumans, as people not worthy of life um, to be slaughtered. And, yeah. and so when the successors, the, the, the follow-on generations of Banderists start turning to ethnic Russians in the Donbass and, uh, and say, and call them orcs, yeah. uh, call them Muscal, which is a, 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 you know, a, a, an insulting term for you know, Muscovite for, for Russians, um, you have to take seriously the possibility of genocide because what they're carrying out yeah. is a cultural genocide off the start where they delegitimize the language, the religion, the culture, the identity. And the next step to that is cancellation. And uh, then if you're still there, they kill you. And, and this is what that, they do historically. There was that speech by Poroshenko where he said, you know, their kids will be hiding in cellars and our kids will be going to kindergarten. And that's the mildest speech. There's other speeches about how they're going to go out there and well, it's not just speeches. We Odessa. saw what they did in Odessa, where they stuffed 150 people into the trade union building, set it on fire, and cheered as 48 of them died. So, so it's um, real. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so the they didn't surrender uh, in March or April, but so that I think that was like an unfortunate surprise from the Russian perspective, which I think that was their their goal. Um, so it was their goal. Their goal was not to yeah. invade and defeat. It was to invade and compel. But then the fortunate surprise, I think, probably Russia was also surprised by this, at least a little, was that the sanctions, all the sanctions didn't actually uh, work and that India, China, and lots of the global South just didn't go along with them. They didn't, they refused right. to but join. This was not a, I mean, some analysts like me, um, yeah. In December, I, I specifically wrote the sanctions would backfire and that uh, it would yeah. collapse the European economy for this. But you know what? If you look at my resume, you're not going to see a PhD in economics. Right? <laughs> I think need I know. You didn't I need think it. I know a lot. I think I understand a lot. But the bottom line is, um, you know, just because I'm certain of something doesn't mean it is or others share my certainty. And what we know now about the inner circle around Vladimir Putin is they did not share my certainty that they were very concerned 
about the uh, economic consequences of sanctions. A lot of people say, why didn't the Russians mobilize? Why didn't they mobilize up front? Why didn't they declare war? Well, we know phase one was designed to be quick and use a peacetime complement to overwhelm and compel to surrender. But when that failed and they moved into phase two, the basically from uh, April until August, uh, and it became this meat grinder operation where they concentrated their resources in the Donbass, but left wide open their flanks in Kharkov and Kherson. Uh, why didn't the military say, hey, boss, we're undermanned on the flanks. This is a very risky thing. We don't have you know, our, our, our defense in depth where we have huge gaps in our line. Um, we need to mobilize. We need to get more troops. But Putin is sitting there thinking the following. I mean, again, people disregard this as part of the ignorance of people who uh, call Putin a uh, dictator or an autocrat. Putin is a democratically elected president of a nation that has democracy. It might be imperfect in our eyes, but it's a Russian democracy. And he is uh, accountable to the Russian people who can and will vote him out of office if he fails to uh, you know, respect their wishes. This was not a popular war. The decision to go into Ukraine was not a popular decision at all. Um, it was a necessary decision from the leadership standpoint, but not a popular decision. So one way that you mitigate a massive rise in unpopularity is to keep it as a peacetime complement. I mean, the soldiers that are already in the military are the ones you're going to fight. You're not going to prevail on the citizens to cough up more men. Uh, and that's OK in phase one. But now you come to phase two and the military is saying we might need more resources. But phase two, Putin's still sitting there going, what about the economy? What about the economy? Because it wasn't certain what China was going to do. China was, you know, China has this Westphalian principle position about sovereignty. And China was like, we're not too happy about this invasion thing. We don't like that. India, the same way. We're not too pleased about this. There were no guarantees that China and India would open up their economies. That was still a negotiation in process. Exactly. Um, there was no guarantee that Russia would be able to successfully entangle itself from Western you know, uh, economic uh, structures. Uh, and if they were unable to untangle, then sanctions really would have hurt because now the Russian economy is tied to the Western economy. And so sanctioning it can cause the collapse that the West was looking for. So Putin's in the business of disentangling a significant uh, percentage of the Russian economy, trying to transition the other economy there while he's fighting a war that's expensive. And he's going, holy cow, I can't. If I'm asking the Russian people to tighten their belts and face up to maybe 15, 20, 25 percent contraction in the economy, I can't turn around and mobilize. This would be suicide. It would do what the West wants and could lead to what uh, the Ukrainian government wants and the Western government wants, which is a Moscow Maidan moment where the Russian people rise up in the street and throw Putin out on his ear. Um, so he has to tread very carefully managing the economy, managing the conflict, and he can't do the things that we in the West that say, well, that was logic. He should have mobilized them. No, he couldn't mobilize them. Right. So what well, happens that then is surprise, maybe to some extent, that China and India don't go along with the sanctions. Uh, and then a little bit maybe of surprise uh, <laughs> that um, that Germany is so willing to sacrifice its own economy for the sake of this war. That that went a little bit beyond what I think anybody- All of Europe, not just Germany, especially yeah. Germany because of the, the absolute dependence on gas, but the whole um, lemming to a cliff mentality of Europe yeah. to say, we're gonna sanction, 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 the consequences be damned, if I could say that on your air, I apologize, yeah, of kind of offended by that language, but- no, that that was that was very surprising as well, and um, and then and, we have Seymour Hersh's article, which is in June, in the middle of this process. The U.S. apparently put bombs on, sent deep sea divers uh, to put bombs on the pipelines, which they then later blew up. In blew September. up in September. Yeah, well, you know, we knew. I mean, it's not that this was a surprise when you have Joe Biden on February seventh in yeah. front of Olaf Schultz in uh, Schultz in the uh, White House say, "Yeah, if Russian tanks move into Ukraine." He smirked. I haven't seen him smirk like that since did he you was see... calling you Scotty Boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Scotty Boy. Uh, <laughs> but did you see Olaf Schultz's face? Yeah, yeah. He looked like a like a scared kid. Yeah, and, and I he don't... was just like yeah. 
And Hirsch's article says there's really not that many people that, I mean, Biden knew, but, but they didn't tell everybody that they were going to do it. They just did it. And I, I think- can't, I, I honestly, Scott, this is one of the things I still haven't wrapped my head around. I can't believe that they would do that to Germany. Like a, it's, it's Germany, you know, like it's their ally. It's well, but the history of, uh, I mean, yes, superficially, you're hundred percent correct. Yeah. Allies, NATO allies, longtime friends, American troops, the brotherhood, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. But if you go back to the, since the sixties, the United States and Germany have been clashing right. about post politic, about the German desire to have good relations with the East. We didn't want that. Germany wanted to open up its economy early on to allow uh, Russian gas and Russian energy to come in. We didn't want that. Germany wanted a peace treaty. We didn't want that. Uh, So there has been conflict and tension and friction between Mm -hmm. the United States and Germany for decades. And the Nord Stream pipelines, Nord Stream 1, which I think came into being somewhere around 2012, and then Nord Stream 2 came in 2018, 2019. Yeah. Uh, but we were dead set against both of those. We right. were, did not want them. We viewed that as the Russians getting economic leverage over Europe. Um, it was, you know, sending us in the wrong. And Germany's looking at it saying, no, that's what makes us work. You see, we yeah. get this cheap Russian gas and we can save, because you just said, uh, you know, 200 billion uh, euros in subsidies to get to keep up. Well, imagine. If that's what it costs now, the difference between market price, and it won't be that high because the market's gone that crazy. But let's say it's a hundred billion a year. Yeah, Over yeah. the course of 20 years, that's again, I'm marine math. I might not be the greatest in the world, but that's like two trillion yeah, euros yeah. Um, that could be invested in infrastructure, healthcare, education. There's a reason why Germany has such a high standard of living. It's because they can cough up true. Two trillion extra euros for reinvestment into Germany that otherwise wouldn't exist if they had to pay market price. And the United States is looking at saying unfair economic advantage, unfair com- competition. Germany becomes the enemy. And but that's then, why. Newland, and Newland said, we're very gratified that it's a hunk of metal at the bottom metal. of the sea. I yeah. can't. I, yeah, to say that, to just like spit in the Straight face out. of. Yeah, but the point is, uh, we've all been lulled into a false sense of uh, normalcy, thinking that the United States is the friend of Germany. Germany's been the strategic enemy of the United States for decades. Remember the animosity Donald Rumsfeld had uh, in the lead up to the the old Europe, Mm -hmm. old Europe, new Europe, old Europe. That is reflective of, you know, a a ingrained sense of um, of uh, animosity. Uh, between the United States and Germany that nobody's talking about. Mm-hmm. We, have, we have viewed Germany as a strategic competitor and in some cases a strategic adversary for decades. So it should not be a surprise to anybody that we blew up their uh, strategic energy infrastructure because they are the enemy in this mm-hmm. case, not just Russia, but Germany. And the Germans need to wake up. That's a domestic German problem. That's up yeah, it seems say, a but- very one-way uh- relationship <laughs> well now and now and now you know take a look at the role germany plays in um in in facilitating the flow of information to support etc ramstein air base rhine main air base uh the the hamburg ports all of this is essential for flowing materiel into uh into ukraine so the germans have to wake up to the fact that not only did we stab them in the back but we're using them as a colonial and their foreign framework. minister says we are we are at war with Russia. With not Russia, with yeah. Well, Russia'd like to, to remind them. And they, <laughs> hey, uh, go 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 to the Bundestag. Yeah. Exit. Turn right. There's a thing <laughs> called the Tear Garden. Look at it. Yeah. You'll see there's a big memorial there. Flanking it are uh, plinths with two T35, T34, 85 tanks. Uh, that was the last time you went to war with us. Mm-hmm. We can upgrade those to T90s anytime you want. That's mm-hmm. what the Russians should say. But Lavrov's far too. So now that takes us to the September to now, I guess, phase. Well, not really. No, there's no. there's another phase that's missing okay. in all of this. Okay. Um, because, you know, the original question was casualties, and we're going to get to that in a second. Yeah. But uh, there were significant casualties that took place in phase one. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Uh, the Russians took a big risk by pushing in so quickly without destroying things because they were trying to 
fell but overwhelmed. And some of their columns were cut off and slaughtered by the Ukrainians. So the Russians took heavy casualties, but they still managed to seize a lot of territory and kill a lot of Ukrainians. I also get this sense of the like, you know, gr growing up and watching the way the Americans, you know, uh, fight. Um, I, I, I get a different feeling like when the I, I've seen Russian commentary on when their columns are surrounded and destroyed and they're sort of like, well, it's war. What do you expect? Whereas when it happens to U.S. soldiers, they're like, you know, no more well, Mr. Nice Guy about it. Right. So, yeah, I mean, you know, there's a, remember Nasiria, yeah, Nasiria yeah. 2003 when um, uh, saving uh, Jessica, um, you know, the, the, the blonde haired, good looking West Virginia girl that got taken prisoner. Oh, um, I, yeah, I must have missed this. You know, her, 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 her seventh motor transport company or whatever uh, got lost, took a wrong turn, and they ended up going through Nasiriyah, getting ambushed by the uh, Iraqis. Oh. Uh, most of them were killed. Some of them retreated. Some were captured. And, um, you know, it became a big deal that, uh, you know, we lost troops and all that stuff. And mm -hmm. the Russians, will, you know, the Russian attitude would be, shouldn't have made that right hand turn. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, we'll, it just it's a little different. We'll, we'll it does on, seem but, a little culturally different. But the Russians took casualties, but not not a lot. Yeah. But now they they move into the next phase, which is this meat grinder phase. You know, yeah. we talk about the Battle of Bakhmut taking place today. Um, that battle began in May, mm -hmm. in earnest. In May of uh, it wasn't in Bakhmut; it was uh, further to the uh, to the west or oh, east. Oh. Yeah, to the east. yeah, to, to the east. But um, that meat grinder, where the Russians said, "Okay, no more thrusts. We're mm -hmm. going to sit here." We're going to grind them down with artillery, massive artillery, and then we're going to move in, clear the trench, grind them down again, move because, in, and clear the trench. And this is happening because this is like a very fortified, fortified area. Uh, For eight years, the yeah. Ukrainians have turned this into an anthill, concrete bunkers. Uh, and if you take a trench, be careful because there's a bunker there that's going to shoot down the trench line to kill you that you didn't see. And mm -hmm. if you get traditional trench clearing operations, you would suffer horrendous casualties yeah so and you can't just you know overwhelm that one trench line because you get bogged down in the second third fourth fifth sixth seventh eighth ninth trench line down there it's just impossible but so the russians slowed it down and then just started hitting them with artillery hitting them with artillery and they were grinding them away and they were destroying the ukrainian army um and, and frankly speaking the ukrainians lost this war sometime in june or july right. of last summer and they um, lost via basically artillery destruction. Artillery grinding them down. But then comes the, the game changer, which mm -hmm. is not game winner, game changer. Mm -hmm. Because the game right now is Russia grinding you down to nothing. Yep. The game changer is NATO providing billions of dollars of exactly. fresh equipment that were then used to train new units using Western tactics with Western intelligence, Western communications, Western weapons. And they came in. And remember when I talked about the overextended flanks? Mm -hmm. uh, when you've got you know 1,500 line uh, kilometers of frontage, and you've put most of your troops in the central area, uh, what's left to cover this might be 50 guys per kilometer. I don't know when the last time you went for a hike in March. <laughs> the climate, but Can't imagine see that guy. <laughs> you know, just imagine defending an area of 50 guys. But in some cases, 50 guys for five kilometers. Right. And uh, there was no artillery because all the artillery was focused on the central battlefield. So all the artillery is supposed to cover that gap. So if the enemy comes in and shoots the gap between two widely dispersed uh, defensive points, normally the artillery will hit it. Plus, doctrinally, there should be a second defense line and a third defense line to slow them down so artillery can then again hit it. There's no artillery, there's no second defense line, there's no third defense line. And these Ukrainian units that were trained uh, to exploit the intelligence that the United States was collecting mm -hmm. where the gap is, they just went through that gap and they kept going. And they'd go 20, 30 kilometers into the rear and start raising havoc in the uh, in, in the Russian rear. So the Russians made the decision because they had some, I mean, and the other thing is the units that are manning the front lines were uh, in many cases uh, police SWAT teams. Yeah, so there's this there is this kind of economy of of force that Russia had been applying up until well, they, they mobilized. Well, they did it there because they couldn't mobilize because yeah. they didn't mobilize. So they were using they had insufficient resources to the task. All the combat effective units were gathered in the central area, and the other ones weren't. And uh, so the Ukrainians exploited it. 
And, and so, what, yeah, what, I mean, that's that's very interesting because the Ukrainians do have they have a real time, complete picture of where the Russians are because the Americans are giving yep. that to them all the time. Yeah. And they, they they exploited it very well. I mean, mm-hmm. hats off to the Ukrainians as a military person. I'm sitting there going, wow, impressive. But what the Russians did is they they said, we're not going to sacrifice the lives. You know, the, yeah. the Hitler hedgehog. Remember, in the, yep. well, say, remember, we're if you've read the history of the Battle of Moscow, when yeah. the Russians launched their uh, winter offensive to push the Russians back or the Germans back, Hitler ordered uh, the troops not to retreat one inch, to hedgehog in, hold up. And uh, they'd break the back of the Russian attack, absorb. Some of the hedgehogs were overwhelmed, other ones held. And eventually the, the, the Russians, the Soviets lost their offensive surge yeah. and the Germans were able to consolidate the line, but at great cost, horrific cost. Well, the Russians didn't hedgehog. They went, we're not playing that game. Everybody up to the rear. Hey, boss, we got 12 tanks that aren't fueled. Leave them. Boss, we got equipment that's not ready. Leave it. I want the manpower out of here. Abandon yep. the equipment. We can get new equipment. We can't get new manpower. They pulled them back, and they consolidated the defensive line and started to defend doctrinally with proper uh, unit concentration, artillery, defense in depth, and the Ukrainians ended up breaking their neck against this. And they, all those troops that they built up, they lost. Ask yourself why today the Ukrainians are begging for weaponry, because everything we gave them is gone. Ask mm-hmm. them why they're begging for, why they're kidnapping men off the street, because we've killed all the reserves that they built up. Meanwhile, for the first time, Putin is calling his people in, and they said, hey, uh, this is a new kind of war. This is no longer Russia versus Ukraine. This is Russia versus the collective West, Russia versus NATO. And that happened incrementally because it's like there's right. high Mars, then there's tanks, now tanks there's all, F-16s. Right. It didn't happen all at once. But but it's sort of and this is what makes it kind of scary, right? Because it's like there there's this, they're sending this, and then the Russians have to match, and then the then NATO sends more. And so the Russians never had to match, they had to adapt. They had to adapt. I mean, yeah. you, you know, the the there's three weapon systems that have proven to be um very uh, problematic for the Russians. Uh, one is the M777 uh, American howitzer. The other one is the uh, French uh, Caesar uh, mobile artillery piece. These are all artillery. Uh, just, uh, yeah, all yeah. Uh, they're all artillery. And then the last one is um, is HIMARS. Yeah. Um, all three of these, you see, the Russians, just just like everybody, you fall into a pattern of behavior. So you 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 take what the enemy is going to give you. So if the enemy is using ineffective D-30, D-20, uh, you know, 2S-1, 2S-3 Soviet-era howitzers, you adapt to that, to the range and the uh, accuracy, and so you get lazy. So, for instance, you might take your command post, and instead of doing an Alpha Bravo command post, jumping it, so if you lose one, you still have command, you'll put everybody into one because it's more convenient, less gas, easier, and you'll move it up to the front, and you'll do that logistically. Instead of spreading your ammo dumps out, um, again, which requires a lot of uh, vehicles and a lot of coordination, you just say, ah, bring them all together and cluster them here. And it's we have a central ammunition. Deployment. And they were doing that as part of this um, this grind, meat grinder war. Mm-hmm. And suddenly, these new artillery pieces come in with high precision rounds, longer range, and perfect intelligence. And so the U.S. is sitting there going, man post of the uh, you know X battalion of the X brigade is right here, right now. The general's there. And the Ukrainians went, thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Boom, 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 bam. You suddenly have a dead general, a dead staff. There yeah, are some of those stories. There are ammunition's all here. Boom, boom, boom. Bam, you just took out you know, four days supply of ammunition for the frontline units. And the Russians went, holy cow. So now they had to go back and adapt. First, they had to adapt to the M777. They had to adapt to the Caesar. They had to adapt to the HIMARS. But they have done so. Now they have operational methodologies in place that minimize. Plus, um, they've carried out very effective counter battery operations. Uh, the M777 is a, almost an extinct species right now on the battlefield. Uh, the Caesar can't mass fires. It's moving in, firing, and leaving because if it stays there, drones connect it and the Russians are hitting it. And HIMARS, the Russians are shooting down 90% of the missiles launched. What do you what? make of the Iranian drone story? Is this real? Well, I mean, when it first came out, I discounted it. Yeah, I mean, I believe the intelligence Same. because they showed yeah. they showed the photographs of the Russian uh, specialists there, and I said, okay, but you know, it, it's becoming a drone war. You know, early on, it was like advantage uh, Ukraine with the Turkish drones. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, and you saw the videotapes of the drones firing things and killing Chechens and killing people. But then the Russians adapted and they started shooting down the Turkish drones, bringing electronic warfare. Um, so, I mean, some innovative stuff's come in here. Uh, yeah. A drone gun. <laughs> Have you seen it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's this big, giant electronic thing. And you aim it at the drone and you jam the signal to the EMP. satellite and then the drone goes stupid. Yeah. Um, and, they, and now they have other systems in place that do the same thing. So they nullified the Turkish drones. Um, but now you got these little commercial drones coming in, dropping grenades and all this kind of stuff. But the drone war is actually far more sophisticated than that. It's, uh, it's not just loitering munitions like uh, the Russians call it the Landsat. And I forget what we call our, uh, our loitering drone. Um, which is not very good, by the way. Um, but they still need the, the Russians. I think they've. Been, I, I spoke to a Russian officer, and he said, "Yeah, we had a drone doctrine that was geared towards a sort of a large-scale maneuver conflict with NATO. What it wasn't geared for is this positional warfare of war of attrition. Um, and so we don't have the tools for this job. So they went to the Iranians and said, "What do you got?" The Iranians went, we got this, we got that. And the Russians went, we like this. And uh, apparently, um, they procured some intact sets, although nobody's admitted that yet. But I think some of the debris that's been found uh, indicates that they were intact. But they, in kits, and then the Iranians came and worked with the Soviet defense industry or Russian defense industry so the Russians could uh, produce it from scratch. And so what we're seeing right now are and then the other thing the Russians do, because they're very good, um, they employ it and they learn things about it. They learn how the Ukrainians are. So then they adapt it. So we're on yeah. something like the 10th uh, generation of the Shahid-136 Geranium-2 drone that now has you know, different materials, different capabilities, different variants. They have dummies that go in to get the radar up. And they have other variants that come in right after that. They hit the radars. So, and it's been a game changer. So the, so the U.S. is going to be upset because... Presumably, maybe the Russians will share some of this insight back to the Iranians. And this is one of the problems that the Not U.S. Just the has Iranians, now. the Chinese. Yeah, this is one of the problems <laughs> that the U.S. has now, which is, you know, announcing like we want regime change in Iran. We want regime change in China. We want regime change yeah. in Russia. And also we expect China to, to help us against Russia. We expect Iran to stay out of it, but there's no incentive to anybody to do that. None, none whatsoever. And if you're going to target a nation, uh, then they're going to help another targeted nation and they're going to feed. Look, the Iranians um, are, are getting some very uh, useful um, insight into how the West fights, technologies that are involved, and also about drone warfare. I mean, the Iranians are pretty good at it. Just ask the, uh, the Saudis the about Saudis the Houthis and fire yeah. You know, but um, they're getting better now. And this is a, a part of the war that I don't think um, uh, people are kind of, we, we talk about an artillery war, but it's, you know, a lot of the artillery is supported by drones who collect the targeting intelligence, yeah. feed it back. And then also these loitering munitions, which are sort of an extension of artillery. It's still fire support going in and taking out artillery pieces and everything. And the Russians are very, very uh, good at this. But now this is the, you know, the, the NATO attack, that phase. But now Putin becomes liberated because yeah. he's starting yeah. to get, first of all, he's able to articulate to the Russian population that this is no longer a Russian-Ukrainian conflict. This is a Russian conflict against the collective West. And there's and so now, many admissions. There's just so, so many, many uh, admissions from yeah, you NATO You don't officials. even have to make it up. You just, yeah. you, you, there it is. And the important thing is that the Russian people, by and large, bought into it. Yeah. Uh, meaning, and it, it wasn't a hard sell. They went, yeah, we agree with you, boss. This is now... This has changed. It's not us versus Ukraine. This is the West trying to destroy us with a strategic objective of the strategic defeat of Russia. And we can't allow that to happen. The other oh, wait, is wait, can we just uh, yeah. maybe two minutes on the bio lab thing? Because the bio lab <laughs> just was so bizarre, right? Russia captures some things and they say, listen, we think we have documents proving that the U.S. was working on biological weapons targeting Slavs experimenting on Ukraine, like some just bizarre stuff, hard to believe. No, and then, I believe and, every and then, single word. And then, and then they ask Newland, and Newland says something like, uh, no, we don't have the, Ukraine doesn't have that, but God forbid, forbid if, they, if it falls into the Russian hands. So it's like, yeah. wait, but what are you afraid of? If, <laughs> but, but, it's, but it's not even Newland. Uh, before the war started, the, the, the uh, American who was, 
First of all, it's not a question. We had bio labs in Ukraine. It's unclassified. We have documents. Uh, we, we, we brag about it. It's part of the Co Cooperative Threat Reduction Agency um, you know, program to go in there and provide an employment mechanism for Ukrainian oh, yeah. biologists so they don't take their weapons of mass destruction skills elsewhere. And then it became a vehicle of, um, of doing uh, advanced experimentation, maybe in a uh, atmosphere that was less restrictive than what you would get in the United States. Right. And there's, I will say this, every document the Russian have that I've looked at is 100% accurate. Their interpretation of those documents might not be that, but you know, a little pessimistic uh, or <laughs> that, well, yeah, they might be reading more into something right. than actually was. But um, the bottom line is we were doing some things that were unsavory, unethical, and frankly speaking, illegal from a weapons of mass destruction management standpoint. We are signatories to the Biological Toxin Electrons Convention, and we are in violation of that straight up by our own admission. That's what shocked me when the director of this program uh, was saying, well, the thing that worries me the most is that the Russians might bomb one of these uh, facilities and take out the power um, to the refrigeration and then crack the containment. And so as these things thaw, they could be released and we might have some of uh, the old Soviet pathogens be released. And I'm like, wait a minute, uh, there are not supposed to be any Soviet pathogens. They were all supposed to be destroyed. destroyed. You took control of this facility. The treaty obligates you not to receive or retain these kind of things. They should have been destroyed. We're coming on 17 years into this program and you're telling me it's still there. Oh, Why? Well, that, that reminds me, we also, I also don't want to neglect the fact that there was the Zaporizhia nuclear plant, which, which was being shelled Ukraine on a daily was basis by the shelling. Ukraine, yeah. deliberately so, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you know, the, the, you know, the Ukrainians, they don't, they don't get a pass and neither do the, do the United States. And this all factors in, remember at the beginning, I was talking about, there's two ways to calculate casualties, mm -hmm. one is to evaluate the consistency of the argument. Yeah. The Russians have been consistent from day one. Um, they don't. You know, Russians are not very good at information warfare, meaning uh, they're not good propagandists uh, yeah. to sell what they're doing. They just do it. Whereas we're spinning all the time. We're like hamsters in a wheel, just spinning, 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 yeah. trying to explain away stuff, deny, 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 admit, deny, 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 admit. And um, it colors your impression. But so we, we come, Putin now is able to mobilize 300,000 yeah. reserves. Now, what was interesting about that is... Uh, depending on whose figures use, maybe upwards of 200,000 Russians fled. Um, the Russian men fled. Um, but notice that the Russians didn't close their borders. Yeah. The Russians mm -hmm. didn't try to stop them. The Russians went, thus yeah. Yeah. leave. Because the people who fled were basically the constituency of Russian oppositionists like Navalny. In fact, many of them who fled, fled as part of a Navalny-driven propaganda campaign where they fled and then they would start speaking to the media, telling the same story, trying to spin things to influence what's going on back in Russia. But back in Russia, you have the rest of the population very stoically saying, um, yeah, we got to do this. Oh, you're calling me up? I don't want to do it, but I'm going to do it. I show up, going to get trained. And I liken what ha has happened to Russia to... Um, something that I read about in Rick Atkinson's wonderful trilogy about the uh, U.S. Army in World War II. Uh, it starts off with the North Africa campaign, second volume is about Sicily and Italy, third volume is about Europe. But by the time you get to the end of the second volume, you see this conscript military, these draftees uh, in the United States who didn't want to be there. I mean, everybody's talking about Pearl Harbor effects. These guys didn't want to be there. They wanted to be home. They were drafted. But there's this growing recognition that war is a nasty business, and the only way you're going to get home is by killing the enemy and ending the war. And so these draftees became hardened killers and who were committed to the awful task of war. And I look at these 300,000, and I look at them coming in, and I'm like, you know, this, they, they don't get to go home until the war is over. Mm -hmm. And they want to be home. And they also believe in the mission. They understand this is an existential conflict where the NATO is trying to kill them. And these guys are going to do the job. They're going to do the hard job. They're going to die. They're going to be wounded. 
that they're going to kill the Ukrainians and they're not going to stop killing them until this job is done. And that's yeah. where we are today. And unfortunately, the Ukrainians have the same mentality, right? I mean, they're, they're, well, they do, they're, but they're running out of guys with that mentality. Well, this is a yeah, the <laughs> moon. Of, I believe moon of Alabama said something like Russia has already destroyed the Ukrainian army twice and yeah. is in the process of destroying the third, the third time. Yeah. I agree. Look, so. now, now we come to the, you know, the question of, you know, how do we count casualties? Um, and the one way, again, is the consistency of argument. And I think I've made the case that I feel that the Russians are far more consistent in their, 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 their entire approach to talking about this war. They've been honest. There's consistency in the argument, et cetera. And we can see distinctive phases, whereas the Ukrainians from day one have been just trying to sell us a, you know, a, the Brooklyn mm -hmm. Bridge. Um, they're, they're, they're like a used car salesman trying to impress me with shiny chrome and all that, but the engine don't work. Um, yeah. But that's okay. Now I pull into the professional side. You see, um, again, I'm, I'm not bragging, but I've, I had some pretty uh, relevant experiences in my life. And one of the most relevant uh, took place uh, between uh, October and December of, um, of uh, 1990, mm -hmm. when um, I uh, was assigned to the War Fighting Center at uh, in Quantico, Virginia, um, to the War Gaming Division. And they had this, uh, they, they had this Janus computer and uh, it's been upgraded since then. But back then it was a, a sort of a supercomputer that was designed to do war games. So my job was to identify weaknesses in the Iraqi defenses that could be exploited by the Marines. And so I got the photographs from the CIA. I, I built on the computer an exact replica of the layout of the Iraqi defensive positions. And then we, we occupied it with the Iraqi units uh, each piece of equipment, each squad, the weapons they had. Uh, I did an analysis of the logistical sustainability, where their ammo was, how they would get it. I uh, got into doctrinal employment of troops, uh, which troops had combat experience against Iran, et cetera. And I, I spent a lot of time programming this. And then I built the Marine units based on unit histories, unit composition, et cetera. Did the same thing. Very detailed calculations going into this. And then you hit, you, you line it up, you give them the direction of advance, you give them, you know, their orders, and then you hit play, and then you watch it, but you play out, boom, 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 boom. And I have to tell you, the first couple of times I hit play, the Marines got wiped out, and we're just sitting there going, that ain't right. Um, why? So now you have to go down and break all the numbers down. Oh, we gave the Iranians or the Iraqis far too much PK, uh, probability of kill for their artillery. Let's, let's adjust that to reality. Um, we gave them too high of a rate of fire. They're not that well trained. Adjust that. Uh, we we didn't give our counter battery fires sufficient lethality. Adjust that. We start adjusting the numbers to get it down. And suddenly we hit this fine point where we hit play. The battle unfolds the way it should. Because there's other times where the Marines just cut through them like that. And we're going that ain't right either. What's going? On? We gave the Marines too much capability. All that stuff. So we find the balance. And then we played this over and over again throughout the line. And I became very good at rapidly uh, assessing combat capability of units in specific terrain and lethality of effect. And here's the thing, what I predicted would occur, because uh, I, I, I wrote this up and it was sent to the Marines. What I predicted would occur is exactly what occurred, exactly what occurred. So are you doing that? Like, is that, are there Russians doing, Russians and Ukrainians and Americans doing that right now? Like constantly adjusting it to what they're seeing with data? And uh, is that well, like a... Any professional staff would do this. Yeah, so that's... And the Russians have a, a very good set. I know the United States is war gaming this out constantly uh, in mm -hmm. Germany, back in the United States, using the updated, the, the updated genus computers, which are even faster and better than the ones I use. But my point is, so you're suggesting the Ukrainian uh, military is not entirely independent of U.S. Uh, command and control? The Ukrainian—I mean, that was, I mean, that it's a, it's that a, was a facetious question. <laughs> it's, a, it's a sovereign. It's a sovereign state with a sovereign military, but uh, I would say that the Ukrainians know that if they deviate from the directions given to them by the Americans, then the outcome will probably be. Um, Bad. And if they so you're just, you're uh, even just on the basis of trusting the Americans to know better militarily, maybe, or just have better capacities to do this kind of work. Well, Is that what you mean? The, uh, they have better technology. Yeah. Um, and they're uninterrupted by Russian artillery fire, right. uh, Russian aerial attacks. 
no uh, electrical out outages. Uh, they have but like if we hear we hear, for example, that it's Zelensky specifically who's refusing to uh, order a retreat from Bakhmut. No, whatever. that's probably that's probably accurate. That's yeah. probably accurate. The Americans are probably saying you you might want to get out of there now or else you're going to lose these guys. Mm -hmm. And Zelensky is saying, well, if I pull out, then or the Americans might be saying. You can't pull out because that'll create this uh, morale issue and you have to sit there and fight because if morale collapses, then we're going to have a hard time getting Congress to cough up more money. So, you know, I'm not privy to the conversation, but I would say that there's there's give and take. There where take. Both sides are constantly talking to one another. But my point is, when I when I look at the battlefield, my brain automatically goes back. It's like anything. Um, if you uh, I don't know, did you play sports? Uh, you know, yeah, you actually know? martial arts. Uh, OK, martial arts, that this is even better. Uh, conditioned response, yeah. conditioned response so, so that you're actually doing something before you actually think about it because it's conditioned response. Yeah. Um, and that happens in combat, especially you have to be. That's why it's repetitive training, repetitive training, repetitive, because and that's why people are yelling at you. That's why you're making noise. That's why it's sleep deprivation, because mm -hmm. you have to train like you're going to fight and your body has to be conditioned to have conditioned response, repetitive motion. So that when boom, 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 people die, blood, screaming, everything, your body's still going to do what it was trained to do. It won't have time to go into shock and think. Well, my brain, unfortunately, <laughs> has been programmed uh, to look at every combat situation as if it's a giant Janus simulation. And uh, and so I just sit there and look, 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 and I, I'm running the numbers. And believe me, after doing it for three solid months, it's repetitive. My brain's conditioned. I know what factors... I'm looking for, and you know, I'm automatically searching out logistical sustainability, command and control. I'm looking at the terrain. I'm looking at the artillery. I'm looking at the weather because the ground soil conditions impact. You know what's going to happen. I'm looking at doctrine. Is it going to be you know uh, uh, a DP? Uh, you know, uh, or is it going to be airburst, or is it going to be a mix of the two? And you do this, and then you go boom, and suddenly I'm coming out going, oh, the Russians are going to get eight to one casualty advantage here. Mm -hmm. And so now we look at this at the mass of fires being brought in and you and you start calculating probability of kill based upon density of troop and all that stuff. And you're going, wow, they're going to sustain 60 percent casualties over this period of time. So you look at the number of troops on the front line and it's a battalion and you say, you know, in two days, that battalion is going to suffer a 60 percent casualty rate. That's 500 people. That means 300 and some odd casualties. And now you replicate that across the battlefield, getting the reports of where the battles are going and the numbers just start adding up. And it's and, and then you take a look at what the Ukrainians can do to the Russians. And that's why anybody sitting there go, the Russians have suffered 180,000 dead. How? How? You tell me how that happened. Because I'm running the numbers. I'm looking at it, the thing. And it ain't going to happen. Not on your best day. You could give the Ukrainians 100 percent, you know, lethality of every round they fired. They're still not going to kill 180,000 Russians. Um, it, it just doesn't work that way. And. And then you then the other thing you have to factor in is the whole and I have an advantage here because I was in field artillery and I would actually help train the Marines uh, early on. My battalion took the lead in adapting tactics to, designed to defeat a Soviet enemy. Other than that, we used to fight. You know, when I came in, we were fighting World War II type artillery battles, and we would all die because the Russians have far more artillery. So we were doing shoot, move, communicate, counter battery, counter battery, counter battery war. And so I'm sitting there looking at the artillery war. Doing, you know, running the counter battery. I, I helped perfect uh, early um, counter battery radar uh, employment in a, in a. So wait, so you're are you are you saying that Americans and therefore presumably Ukrainians uh, have a little bit of specific knowledge of how to fight artillery battle from a disadvantage, like on the assumption that the Russians are going to have more artillery yes. than. Yeah, yes, that's interesting. Uh, no, that that's how I trained. Um, <laughs> disadvantage, but here's the difference. Um, every, I operated in a maneuver warfare environment right. where we could use space and maneuver to our advantage to prevent the Russians or the Soviets from acquiring a uh, situational dominance. Uh, right. Because if we stayed in one place too long, then they were going to come in with artillery that would just wipe us out. So we're moving, moving, moving. The difference here is this is positional warfare. Right which locks the both sides into, you know, disadvantages from, you know, survivability standpoint. For the Ukrainians to be able to put fire on the Russians, they have to bring their systems 
into range to hit the Russians. And if you can shoot the Russians, they can shoot you. There is no range advantage. Everybody's going the high Mars out. The Russians have things that outrange the high Mars. Yeah, uh, Mars. And then the other, the other thing that I uh, developed was um, I'm literally, again, I'm the guy who first started using pioneer drones uh, to adjust artillery. Um, you know, back in, in 1986, 1987, nobody did that. Uh, the Israelis were working on it. But for the United States Marine Corps, for the U.S. military, um, you know, I'm the guy that helped create, you know, how to integrate drones in this. So I have a little bit of knowledge on how this stuff works theoretically. And so I'm looking at how drones are being applied to the battlefield, et cetera. And the point I'm trying to make is when I come up with a number, it's not pulled out of thin air. It's a number that's actually derived from me spending a couple hours closing my eyes and running the battlefield through my head, looking at maps, uh, looking at organizational structures, trying to find unit histories, and then applying all of that in a comprehensive fashion. Is it perfect? Hell no. Mm -hmm. uh, this ain't a Janus computer. This is a human brain. That's a 61-year-old man who drinks a lot of Diet Coke to stay awake. So dogs barking i got people knocking at the <laughs> i got Doing work i gotta do so it's not perfect i'm not pretending that it's flawless but i'm telling you this i believe my numbers and, and and it's turning out my numbers are actually very accurate because the more we're learning about casualty levels and stuff i, I think there's a there's there's we don't see the i mean from a propaganda standpoint you get a wide divergence but when you get to the serious people about numbers the numbers are starting to gravitate to right to where I said they were going to be. So two questions arise. One is, can if assuming Russia's in the process, if if Moon of Alabama is correct and Russia's in the process of destroying the third version, the third iteration, is there a fourth? Can, does NATO have the ability to build a fourth uh, Ukrainian army? Well, uh, yeah. The answer to that is is yes and no. Okay. Uh, right now, there's uh, anywhere from, uh, I, I think, probably 40,000 Ukrainian troops that are undergoing training in one form or another uh, out there. Uh, they might be able to surge that number up to uh, 70,000 total. That's a significant number of troops. But that's less than they've already lost. Oh, it's not enough. Uh, the burn rate is higher than the replenishment rate. That's the other yeah. basic reality of military math. Uh, you, you, your, your combat effectiveness drops significantly as your numbers go down because so, you can't do things you were supposed to do. And if you can't replace the numbers, uh, then your combat, and, and the lower it drops, the higher casualty rate you're going to have, you're going to burn through a lot of people more quickly. The reason that the maneuver war isn't hasn't happened, that Russia hasn't uh, done it or been able to do it is, is I, presumably partly because of the incredible fortification of an entrenchment of the Ukrainian military. Is there a way that they could use that advantage to keep it going? I because for me, it's like, you know, a lot of these wars take years. Like it's not, it's the it's a rare war that takes a year or less to be over. I mean, Georgia was fast, but like the Chechen right. wars or Afghanistan, Iraq, these all took a long time. Well, I, I I don't think this war is going to last beyond um late summer, early fall. Um, because so another year, maybe no, or another uh, half a year, six to eight months. Yeah. Um, because well, I'll let Jan Stoltenberg speak for me. Um, Ukraine's going to run out of 155 millimeter artillery. Uh, there was a, a, a Russian um, officer who spoke of in, in Bakhmut, they're capturing uh, the Ukrainian, um, you know, command posts. And so what they're getting is the, um, the Ukrainian documentation on uh, ammunition allotment. So if it's a command post with artillery units oh, dedicated, yeah. it's the reorder. And on the Soviet uh, stuff, the 122, the 152, it's all nothing. They're getting nothing because they have nothing. They've run out. Um, on the 155 millimeter, actually what he said is they're, they're getting a lot more than we thought they were getting, that the Ukrainians are actually firing more rounds than we thought because they have to, to match the intensity of the Russian uh, fighting, uh, the Russian firepower. But the point is that expenditure rate is beyond that which NATO can sustain. NATO's already, you know, you know we talked earlier about uh, defense industry. Russia's defense industry is up and running. It's kicking out enough ammunition to support this war and the expansion of the Russian military. NATO has not uh, upped its game on defense industry. It takes time. 
to do that. It takes money, it takes resources, it takes planning, none of which has happened. They're only starting the initial phases of that now. But again, it's also a matter of scope and scale. Uh, many private uh, industries are not going to spend the money necessary to gin up a production line if all you're going to do is produce X. They're going to say, in order for this to be profitable to me, I need X times 20. And nobody's sitting there saying, well, we're going to go ahead and commit to that because they don't know how long this war is going to last. So there's no ammunition being built, to, I mean, in sufficient quantities. So the Ukrainians are burning up in a, a week and a half, a month's worth of ammunition production. That's unsustainable. Even if you have a million rounds in reserve, which we had at one point, those are gone. We've given them all the Ukrainians. They fired them. We can't produce anymore. There's nothing left. They run out of ammunition this summer, and there's nothing that can happen to change that equation. And when you run out of ammun artillery ammunition in a war dominated by artillery, you lose. So that's why I believe, one, the Russians don't need to go maneuver warfare on us. I, I, and, I, and I bring this up. You know, maneuver warfare um, looks cool on maps. And it, it's nice in Hollywood because everything's perfect in Hollywood. It always works. But read history. Um, First of all, read the, the 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 maneuver warfare battles that took place um, in, in in 1943 around Kharkov with the back and forth, and uh, look at the casualties, extraordinarily high casualties, and then take a look at, for instance, in the summer of 1944, um, Operation Bagration, which turned into the destruction of Army Group Center. And if you look at the maps, it's like big Soviet arrows, and you're like, wow. And you look at the German casualties, you're like, oh, they swamped them. That's why they collapsed. They're retreating. I say, yeah, but now look at the Soviet casualties. Huge. You're going, holy cow, they lost a million dead? Yep. Big era warfare. In winning isn't... while they were winning. In winning. That's right. Against an enemy that was collapsing and retreating. So, you know, the Russians don't want that. They don't, they don't want that. What they want is to destroy the Ukrainian military. And right now, they have a systemic approach, a very, uh, uh, there's an M word out there, methodologi methodological, I don't know. There's, they have a mythology. <laughs> I'm a Marine. Don't expect me to speak the English language properly. <laughs> but they have, they have a methodology, there's the word, <laughs> that, that they use. And uh, it, it's, it's working. And the other thing people are showing, when does the offensive begin? I'm like, it's already begun. Yeah, it's because not they're, just because well, they're expecting, I mean, I, I've seen a uh, Well, they want the big Kruger. arrows. Yeah. But the point is, all along the front, the Russians are attacking from... Yeah. Zaporizhia up to Limon, um, and even uh, hooking around that. And they're succeeding. Some of the offenses up north are taking five to seven kilometers a day in territory. The Ukrainians, meanwhile, are trying to, they're like a fire brigade running around the different fires. Eventually, you run out of firefighters, you run out of engines, you run out of hose, you run out of water. Yeah. And that's what's happening. And this is before the Russians bring all of their forces that are still training, by the way, in deep breakout operations. Mm -hmm. uh, they haven't even arrived at the battlefield yet. So when they arrive, the Russians are shaping the battlefield to their advantage. They're identifying the weak points in the Ukrainian lines, and they will exploit those. I am very confident that the Ukrainian army cannot sustain the casualties that they are sustaining. I'm very confident that NATO can't replenish the Ukrainian army in a sufficient fa uh, fashion to keep it combat effective on the totality of the front and that the Russians are going to be able to sustain this military operation. The Ukrainians run out of ammunition sometime in July, August, and it's over. So, so I don't, I don't think that, unfortunately, you know, no, like the official Ukrainian uh, spokespeople don't um, agree with the anti-war uh, position, which is like, the way I feel about all this is that the Ukrainians are suffering much worse than anyone else yep. uh, from this whole thing. And I would love if this war could end before there's further destruction of their country. Um, and I, uh, I mean, to the, you know, that, and that, that also gets us to um, the, the question of like an anti-war movement and, you know, I, I, you've been talking about the the anti-war rally and, you know, the left, right, unite against war, which I don't, I don't really believe that's a possible uh, thing to do, but you know, what, what, uh, what this, this all seems very, very distant from, from what an anti-war movement can actually take on. It also seems like 
the anti-war movement such as it is is in a worse the worst state i've seen it uh in probably 20 years in the sense that so much of so many anti-war people are effectively pro-war here um and so like uh, actually anti-war people are very rare uh, yeah. and and very far between and they and they're instantly attacked as being putin apologists and and so yep. on yeah. So, you know, I don't know, like, do you have, a, you, you, I know you were invited to the rally and uninvited to the rally and re-invited to the rally <laughs> yeah, and made a speech yeah, for the rally. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I think there's going to be a, another, uh, what I would consider to be a more uh, authentically anti-war rally coming up in March, I think on the end of March 18th, I think yeah. it is there. Yeah. But like, where, where do you think, you know, what do you think we like anti-war people should be focusing on for the coming year well I, let me let me let me put my first of all i have to you know i think it, you have to be honest about your biases and um i am strongly biased against the anti-war movement in america today because of my experience with iraq um i i find them hypocritical in the extreme i find them to uh, have been um embracing an anti-war posture when the president's name was Bush, but right. when the president was renamed Obama, they disappeared yeah, overnight. He, he single-handedly. And I, yeah. I'm just like, you guys stand for nothing. Right. And they do, they stand for absolutely nothing. I know there's some principled people out there and there's little kernels of, uh, of hope of genuine people, but a movement, there is no anti-war movement in America today. And here's my thing about March 18th. And I've got good friends who are going who are organizing this and are going to be there. And I, I hope they take what I'm about to say um, in the way I mean it, because I want them to succeed. But I remember they, they, they sat there and they mocked the fact that the Rage Against the War Machine only attracted 3,000 people. Yeah. They're like, that's nothing. Well, I want to remind them that they only planned on having 2,000 people show up, that the purpose of this rally wasn't to attract numbers. It was to create an organization that brought divergent points of view together in a singular focus. Um, and while that wasn't perfect, and my experience in it is a little bit bitter, but I'm <laughs> bigger than that. I'm, this ain't the Scott Ritter movement. This right, is right. an anti-war movement. And um, there is potential there if they can get their act together. And that's a big if, I'm not giving them a, a automatic, that the next time they get together, they might have 10,000. And if they can get their act together, they can turn that to 20,000, 100,000, a million. This has potential, potential to achieve those numbers. March 18th, they're talking about 6,000 people. That's the number. That's their number. That's as big as they're ever going to get because they aren't capable of organizing beyond that. That's the maximum potential of the left anti-war movement, 6,000, 8,000, 10,000. They can't. They can't go beyond that because they've self-limited in terms of their purity tests and all this other stuff. Plus, they don't know what they're anti-war about. Are you anti-war or are you anti-suffering? Because here's my point about anti-war. First of all, and I've said this before and I'll say it again, I'm not anti-war. You wanna hurt my country? I will kill you with a smile on my face. I will come at, like you, come at you like Attila the Hun, man. I'm a Marine, I'm trained to kill, I'm old now and I, my knees don't work and my eyes don't work. And so my mouth is the only thing that works. But when I was younger, I'd have been right there urging them going forward. I'm not anti-war. There's, I, I, there's a tweet that got me in a lot of trouble, but I'm not retreating from this tweet. Anybody listening to this who has you know, indicated the dissatisfaction, I don't care because I believe in this tweet. And uh, it was when I was criticized by the, uh, the Libertarian Party as, you know, you're not anti-war. Well, first of all, where were you in 2002, 2003? I know where I was. I was demonstrating, I was organizing, and I wasn't just out there demonstrating, I was doing stuff, like putting my life on the line to go make a documentary film about the truth of weapons of mass destruction, having the FBI come at me like you've never had the FBI come at you before. I'm the guy who went to Iraq in September 2002 and spoke to the Iraqi parliament. No one has ever done that before. I broke all the rules in going over there and I got the Iraqi government to do that, which no one thought possible, which is to invite UN weapons inspectors back in. And that was the only way you were going to stop a war was to get UN inspectors back in to, uh, to show that there was no WMD threat. And when that failed, I was the guy who got Saddam Hussein. And no one, I don't think too many people know this. 
I got Saddam Hussein to buy into six points of peace that would lead to regime change. Not the, that he would leave, but the change in behavior. He agreed to this on the eve of war. And if it weren't for the FBI and some other idiots like the libertarians, I'm not blaming them, that mindset who decided they wanted to destroy me and not give peace a chance, we could have stopped this war, or at least we would have had a fighting chance. So anybody wants to tell me I'm not anti-war, tell you, I'll meet you in the boxing ring and I'll show you my anti-war technique uh, played out in Morse code on your face. I'm not a peaceful man, but I right. hate war with a passion. And I, want, I wanted to stop that war. And that war broke my spirit, broke my soul, crushed me. I'm just being straight up honest. And the anti-war movement is one of the reasons because they let me down. They let themselves down. They let the American people down. They let the Iraqi people down. They let the war, the world down. So now people are like, God, what do you believe about Ukraine? Well, let me tell you what I believe about Ukraine. I believe this war should never have been fought. Yeah. I would have preferred an outcome, but I can't. See, I'm somebody who says, from an American perspective, that we can't go to war unless we've exhausted every option short of war. We, we, there, there's no door uh, to, to a peaceful resolution that has been opened and walked through, that we have tried everything before we take that down. And that war, even then, has to be worth the sacrifice we're asking of the men and women who are going to shed their blood on that battlefield. And so I'm sitting there putting myself in Putin's shoes saying, what more could he have done? Yeah. He spent eight years begging for Minsk to be implemented. Right. And it turns out that nobody was serious. He was the only serious player there. Which he again, they had and Merkel admitted Merkel that, admitted, you know, Hollande admitted, Poroshenko admitted it. You know, and, and Putin has said that was one of the greatest mistakes he's ever made was yeah. believing them. He said we could have ended all of this in 2014 had I just been a little bit more bloodthirsty. Uh, but I believed in peace. I believe they wanted peace. I tried to get peace. The draft treaties they put out there, Russia basically said, here's what we need to stop a war. They wouldn't do it. Then Russia carried out a phase one operation that cost them a lot of guys because they didn't go to war. They sought to, instead of destroy, to compel to the peace table, and they put it all on the line to achieve that objective, and they were betrayed by the West. So I, I think, mean, you could, yeah, Ukraine also assassinated their own negotiators. And, their own uh, negotiator and all that. You know, so it's, but my point is, I can't think of anything more Putin could have done given the circumstances. So now we're at war. Didn't want it. But we're there. So what's the objective now? I know Putin has strategic objectives. I know right. Ukraine the, for us, for us, right? Well, for, for us, us what's yeah. our objective? It has to be to minimize the suffering. Yeah. Once war has become a reality that we can't hit the reverse on, it's there in front of us right now. They're fighting. What do we do as an anti-war movement? You can't say, well, I'm anti-war. Therefore, I can't do anything that legitimizes this conflict. Dude, it's happening. Yeah. You can't change that. It's done. They're at war. So if you're going to say, well, I'm anti-war, therefore I'm anti-Putin, why? He did everything possible to stop the war. They didn't. They wanted it. What do you need to do to minimize the suffering of people? If you're anti-war, you have to care about the Ukrainian. Let me put yeah. it to you this way. At this stage in the game, it's possible that Ukraine has suffered 350,000 plus military dead. Probably another 400 to 500,000 wounded. Many of those wounded's brains no longer work. They don't have limbs. They'll be pissing into a bag the rest of their life. All the things we don't like to talk about when, you know, Americans, I support the troops. Really? When was the last time you went to a VA hospital and changed out the colostomy bag of a 32 year old man who will never walk again because he went to war for your country, the one that you said you wanted to stop, but you didn't stop? I have no patience for these people. So now the Ukrainians are suffering. Tens of millions of Ukrainians have been displaced from their homes. Their homes have been destroyed. Have you looked at the cities where they're fighting right now and the destruction, the level of destruction? Even if the war ends today, they can't go home because there is no home. They are permanently displaced. Now, imagine, do you, are, do you have kids? I'm not asking two personal questions. Yeah. Okay, I have kids. I've raised kids. You know, thank God I had a stable house, income, et cetera, so my kids grew up with a sense of normalcy, education, s social adaption, all that stuff, you know. They're, they're, they're pretty cool kids. Um, but imagine now, yeah. house catches on fire, that happens, but there's no Red Cross, no nothing. As I go to the street, the neighbors are coming in and hitting me with sticks, driving me away into the woods. I have to go live in a country that doesn't want me, get a job that, that I, I'm not, it's not what I'm trained to do. I have to go, you know, shovel poop. 
um, and my kids are in a strange school system and their relatives are dying, they can't go home. Those aren't gonna be well-adapted kids. We have condemned a generation of Ukrainian children Ukrainians. to yeah. a, 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 a horror uh, to a maladjusted life. Yeah. Some of them may be lucky enough to get on the right track, but they're gonna be forever scarred by this experience. If you are anti-war, you have to be against this happening. And this is happening because we have sustained this conflict three times over. This war should have been over early. It could have been over on April 1st. They stopped it. This war could have been over in the summer of 2022 because the Russians were destroying the Ukrainian army. We reinforced. And now we continue to keep this war going by pouring military forces, resources, and financial resources. And we don't give a damn about the people of Ukraine. We can't give a damn when you allow that many Ukrainian soldiers to die in one year. We can't give a damn when we allow over $1 trillion worth of infrastructure damage that will never be repaired by us. We can't give a damn when we've displaced tens of millions of refugees in their own country and out of their country. Don't tell me we care about the Iraqi or the, the Ukrainian people. We don't yeah. care about the Iraqi people either. Yeah. We don't care about anybody. This isn't a war fought for a cause. This is a war fought to hurt Russia. And now we come to the Russians. Okay, because we've talked about the Ukrainians. The Russians have lost potentially um, some 45,000 men. In the decade that America was in Vietnam, we lost 58,000 men. Um, if this war goes on at the intensity, I expect Russia will match that number or exceed that number by the end of the day. All right, so in a year and a half time period, Russia will have suffered casualties equivalent to what we lost in Vietnam, and Vietnam broke the soul of a nation. Okay, then there's the wounded out there. And again, guys, wounded doesn't mean you got a hole in your body and you walk around, you show the girls the scar and you're cool. Mm -hmm. Wounded means you're screwed up for this life. Artillery war. Artillery. Man. Well, if you take a bullet, yeah. high velocity round hits you in the head and you live, your brain is gone. It hits you here, you lose your arm. You're going to, like I said, the, the, the internal damage to the body, the spinal injuries, et cetera. There are tens of thousands of Russians, just like Ukrainians, who will not walk again. Who are going to be in wheelchairs, who aren't going to be able to support their families and all that. And then there are the Russian children who watch their father die or their father get crippled. There are the Russian wives who will never be the same. Russian society that's been torn asunder. So this is a two-way street. The sword of war cuts both ways. It's yeah. cutting both sides horrifically. And we care. We say we care about humanity. We care about people. If you're, I was going to use a bad word. If you're anti-war, and you say, I support the continuation of this war. What about the Russian people? Yeah. Don't tell me you're anti-war if you're willing to have them suffer uh, and pretend that you don't want the Ukrainian people to suffer. So there is no anti-war movement right now. The quickest way to bring this nightmare to an end is to bring it to an end. And unfortunately, the only way it's going to end right now is with a decisive Russian military victory. So I'm going to be frank. If you pretend to be anti-war, then you have to support the quickest possible Russian victory in Ukraine, because that'll be the fastest way to stop the death and suffering. Because otherwise, you're going to buy into a system where we continue to fuel this fire, and that fire will burn as many people as possible. There is one other important point to add to that. Uh, you know, I mentioned that I was going to talk to you about this uh, before we started recording, which is, you know, I am, I can't help but be concerned about what happens to Russian speaking Ukrainians in the event of a Ukrainian victory. Yeah, right. What are we asking for by saying Ukraine wins? Yeah. So, you know, it, the, the, on the one hand, it's like, you know, the, the pro, I don't know, I would call them pro-war people uh, who say, you know, we want Ukraine to get Crimea back and, and get all, all of their territories back. And that's a victory. But if that happens, what, what is their plan? What is their plan for the people that are from there and that live there that they've been at war with? What happens if those people are defeated and they are there? Like, are, is there, is the idea that they're just going to all go to Russia is the plan that they stay there in some reduced form of citizenship i mean or you know it, it, this is one of the this is one of the problems that i i don't hear the, the banderas the banderas know what they're going to do and they've been doing it yeah look at what happened in Izium. look what happened in the kharkov regions that were recaptured cleansing operations came in uh filtering operations they call them they're slaughtering thousands of ethnic russians anybody uh, who 
was uh, accused of uh, supporting the Russian occupation, right. is being killed, murdered on the spot, women, men, children. Um, that's the future of every ethnic Russian in the Donbass, yeah. in Zaporizhia, in, in Kherson, and in Crimea. So if you want Ukraine to win, what you're saying is you're going to tolerate the, uh, the genocide of millions of ethnic Russians. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't see a way around that, uh, right, unfortunately, but, which is why I can't. But, but there's another thing attached to that that um, should scare people even more. If you say you want Ukraine to win, that means you want them to take Crimea. Yeah. And if Ukraine was successful That's in taking Crimea, this constitutes an existential threat to Russia. And Russia has a nuclear doctrine that says they will use nuclear weapons to stop this. Now, those nuclear weapons will not be dropped on Ukraine because Russia has no intention of nuking a fellow Slav nation. Those nuclear weapons will be dropped on NATO, London, Paris, Berlin, Brussels, Rome, Madrid. Maybe some will make it their way to the United States. Some might make it their way to Canada. Um, yeah. The world will end. So all of these people out there you know, saying, we want Ukraine to win, you really are saying you want the world to end. You know, there's there's worse things in the world than accepting the fact that ethnic Russians will have a better life under a Russian government than they would under a Ukrainian government. Maybe uh, when we, we talked again, maybe when uh, Vladimir Putin talked about the uh, the history of development of Ukraine, he was spot on that this is an artificial nation that has been cobbled together in a artificial manner and that they can't get along. How can you get along if you're a Western Ukrainian who views the ethnic Russians as subhumans? Who has a history of slaughtering them in large numbers uh, and has proven that it's not just a historical thing that happened, but they're willing to do it now and are doing it now. So if you're anti-war, you might want to start thinking about being pro-partition. You might want to start thinking about the best way to end this war is on the terms that Russia is talking about, because that provides a long-term solution, because your solution only increases the death and destruction, the potential for the termination of all humanity. Yeah. Well, we've, yeah, we, we've, Unfortunate. I, you know what I think of from your history, Scott, is uh, uh, Will, William Tecumseh Sherman. Uh, he made this speech when he burned Atlanta, or he wrote it, but he said something like, you know, a couple of years ago, if they had stopped, uh, they would have had they would have had peace and harmony for 100 years. If they had stopped last year, they could have even kept their slaves. But now, you know, they're going to lose everything. Over. And Ukraine's going to lose everything. Yeah. I mean, this is a sad fact. If you listen to Putin's February 21st speech that he gave, now in the West, it's been derided. You know, he's angry, he's bitter, he's vengeful. Yes. And, then, and also because he didn't announce the big arrow offensive, uh, it was, you know, it was, it was a, a nothing. Burger. It was underwhelming, yeah. underwhelming. We weren't impressed. Listen to what he said, guys. First thing he said is the focus of effort is the economic and social revitalization of the new Russian territories. Mm -hmm. That means that hey, he's, the wars are going to stop until they push the Ukrainians out of these territories. And the focus is on building these territories up. Then he said, the nature of the weapons provided by NATO will define how far we have to push the Ukrainians back from these borders. And so when NATO is bragging about HIMARS and the small bomb units would go 150 kilometers, Ukraine, by accepting that weapon system, you just guaranteed that this war won't stop. And remember, Russia's winning. You're not. So this war won't stop until Russian forces have pushed 150 kilometers past the current borders of Norussia and Donetsk. And now we come to, I refer people back to Vladimir Putin's 2005 statement, not the one about the Soviet Union collapsing, but the one about he is responsible for all Russians, the Russian nation. If you go 150 kilometers past the Novorossiya and Donbass borders, you get Odessa, you get Nepetrovsk, you get Kharkov. Russian cities populated by majority Russian populations. Ukraine, you're going to lose everything. You are going to lose everything. And the West says they support you. Understand that the worst thing that ever happened to you, Ukraine, was buying into the promise, the false promise of NATO. Because Who was it that said it's it's worse to be it's bad to be Kissinger. America's enemy? <laughs> Kissinger. Yeah. And he would know. <laughs> yeah, he sure would. So he would last know. maybe last question. Okay. Uh, Chinese peace plan. Uh, I guess the Biden already said if if Putin likes it, it can't be good. So that might Biden knows best. <laughs> Biden is yeah with his diplomatic. Uh, acumen. I'm surprised you didn't say you know Vladdy boy. Yeah, Vladdy boy. boy. That's why they get the big so, bucks I mean, and it, you don't. Maybe it's dead in the water. But I mean, do you do you think you know? If, again, as an anti-war person, here I am. Uh, you know, is there some is there some formula with 
China mediating or somebody that's credible that could that could have some kind of deal? Is there a deal that that Russia could accept that that could the be- Russian deal has to at this point in time? First, of all, I have to be careful when I say has to because I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, what I do know is this: that uh, the Russians articulated in phase one demilitarization, right. denazification, yeah. uh, and no NATO. And by the time they got to the one April peace plan that there was going to be signed, uh, they had walked away from demilitarization. They had walked away yeah. from denazification. Yeah, the Israeli guy said that, right? The Israeli yeah. prime and, uh, and, said- and all they all they wanted was no NATO and independence for Donbas and Crimea is forever Russia. Again, getting back to Tecumseh Sherman, had you stopped fighting two years ago, you could have had this. Had they stopped on 1 April, uh, Ukraine would be a, a viable state, uh, very strong, very uh, healthy. And um, Russia would actually have more problems than Ukraine does because of the, the unsatisfactory nature of the, of the peace. But um, they didn't do that. You know, China is interesting because China and Russia prior to the invasion, uh, if you remember, uh, Joe Biden, um, when he met with Vladimir Putin in uh, June of uh, 2021 in Geneva, uh, on his way out, he turned to the press and without without anybody provoking, he said, yeah, I don't want to give away too much about what I said to Vlad, but uh, I told him, man, the Chinese, you got to get away from those boys. Those are bad boys. They're going to come in. They're trying to take over your economy. They're going to come in. You got, but Vlad, you're bad move with the Chinese. You got to come to us, man. Come to us. Be with us. We're, the Chinese are bad, bad, bad people. And Putin's like, thank you very much. Well, there was another speech from a long time ago that's been making the rounds where Biden says, you know, and then I told them, what are you going to do? Go with China? Best of luck in your senior your year. Senior year. <laughs> and, or, and, then, and then why don't you try Iran for that standpoint? <laughs> well, Joe, thank well, you. Here we are. <laughs> yeah, here we are. Iran, China, Russia together. You know, but the thing is, um, Biden and uh, not Biden, uh, 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 Putin and uh, Xi Jinping have a very good relationship. Yeah. Um, it's a relationship that uh, has been formed um consistently over the years. They are both very long-serving leaders. Uh, so it's not like the United States where every 48 years we get this whiplash of leadership and countries are going, who are you, Jekyll and Hyde? Uh, Putin has been consistent for 22 years. Xi Jinping has been consistent for uh, nearly the same amount of time. So they, this is a relationship born of trust and of necessity. Uh, China and Russia are not natural allies. They have been brought together because of the policies of the United States which have been equally uh, oppressive to both. Yeah. Uh, so they've come together, they found common cause. It's an uncomfortable thing for the Russians to do to commit economically to China uh, because yeah. China is big. China, there's a danger of China swallowing Russia. China is so, so different, so right? Russia loves the West. The Russians yeah. love the West. They always They're have learning, them. Yeah. Russia's learning to be indifferent to the West <laughs> um, because the West deserves to be indifferent too. Yeah. Um, but Russia's changing. Uh, the, the, the things are things are changing. But here's China's problem: the whole key to China's policy towards Taiwan is an Westphalian approach to sovereignty, yeah. Um, yeah. saying that Taiwan is China. There can be no interference in the internal affairs of of China. The West, you have to stay out of Taiwan. You can't get involved in Taiwan. That's our business. And Russia went and invaded Ukraine. Um, it's awkward. <laughs> Yeah, because <laughs> us, we, we, we can't say we support you because then we'd be supporting this. <laughs> You've put us in a bind. Um, what do we do? But before the invasion, Putin and Xi got together and they put out this 5,000 word joint statement uh, that basically said, we are closer than allies. We have something better than alliances. And here's where it's important. Uh, they, they, you know, because it's true. Imagine a treaty that they had signed where China would have had to impose a Westphalian principle towards sovereignty because that's China's um, national policy. And so now you have that treaty and Russia invades Ukraine. Suddenly the relationship is fatally flawed, fatally broken. You can't recover from that. But because there's no treaty, China is able to do the following. We don't really like what you're doing there, but we're not going to sanction you either. We oppose your invasion. We'd like you to get out, but we're going to open up gas pipelines and trading pipelines and the whole thing. So China's been doing yeah, this uh, this this dance because it's not a treaty relationship. It's a relationship that's better than a treaty, and that proves it. But now China's in a situation where um, the West, they're looking at the West's strategic intent to destroy Russia, strategically, yeah. and they're saying, there before the grace of God go us. Yeah, and if sense. Russia fails, if Russia loses, then all of that intent is going to be turned on us 
using Taiwan as the same leverage that Ukraine was used against Russia. Yeah. So it's best that we enable Russia to win yeah. right now. So in order to walk away from Westphalian principles, you have to redefine uh, the nature of the conflict away from a Russian-Ukrainian conflict into an existential struggle between Russia and the collective West. But before you can do that, you have to show good intent. You can't just walk away from Westphalian principles. Oh, you have to put I see where you're going. I see. You're saying table. China's peace deal is insincere, I think. I'm not saying it's insincere because I think China would love it if Russia would unconditionally. Right. But they also know that it can't. But that's not going to happen. It's right. not a lack of sincerity on the part of China's fault. They put forward a peace agreement that adheres to their principles of Westphalian sovereignty. But mm -hmm. they also recognize that it's likely not to happen. And when it's rejected, then China will say that closes the door on issues of sovereignty, and it opens the door on a redefinition of the conflict along the lines of it's Russia's sovereignty that's now threatened by the collective West, that the West is using Ukraine as a proxy to take down Russia. And this is unacceptable because that's what the West is going to do with Taiwan against us. And now they are strategically aligning. There, there was that old movie, the Twilight movie, uh, where you had a team, uh, you know, you the had wolves the team, and the, you had the werewolves and you had the vampires and yeah. everybody's like, my team Jacob or my team whomever. Um, well, China's basically saying we're team Russia. They're putting on yeah. the team Russia shirt. That doesn't mean that they support violations of sovereignty and all that, but they're saying that Russia must win this conflict. That yeah. the only way this war comes to an end is that Russia wins this conflict. Now people are saying, well, that means China's going to provide ammunition. I don't agree. First of all, Russia doesn't need it. Probably. They don't need it and they don't yeah. want it. Why? If, if this is an artillery driven war, which yeah. it is, that means the fuel of your war engine is artillery ammunition. And if you want to turn up the heat against Ukraine, you put more fuel in, more ammo, you bang it out. Uh, if you need to hold, you know, drag it out, yeah. you lessen the fuel. But Russia's hand has to be on that throttle. Yeah. If you give the China the ability to supply the ammunition, China's hand's on that throttle. And now I'm the Americans going, Whoa, wait a minute. China now has control of this war. Hey, China, one China policy. We'd like to renegotiate we'll that thing. But what we need you to do is crank down the ammo. Russia's not going to give control of the throttle to anybody. Yeah. It's a Russian throttle, Russian war. Russia will hold on to it. So that's why I don't buy into this China giving Russia lethal aid. So if we were an anti-war, let's see if we can agree. Uh, you know, I know you, I, I think I understand your view. Uh, but if we if if an anti-war movement were to have a slogan like, you know, we need a deal that guarantees Russia's long term security as well as, you know, ends the war and ends the suffering. How about that? What, could that could we could we have that as a slogan? I don't know. I don't know. Here, 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 here's I'm a, trying. I'm trying. I mean, well, give me something. Let, let me throw one. Let me throw one at you. OK. All right. What if we step back and get out of the get out of the weeds? Okay. Take a step back and look at the big picture. What's the biggest fear anybody has about this Russian United States Nuc nuclear conflict? nuclear Armageddon? Bingo. This is where we can get agreement, I believe, with everybody. Forget about peace deal. This try to trying okay. to get into the weeds and and and, and get involved because you're not going to win on that one and anywhere. You might come up with an acceptable slogan for you. But the Russians don't care. That I'll be I'll be holding that I'll be holding that sign somewhere. Yeah, and, okay. and, and people will be driving by. Some will honk in favor. Some will honk <laughs> to harass you, and that's it. There, there's your yeah, day. There's I've, your week. I've done then, that. Yeah. yeah. I've been who there. hasn't? Mm -hmm. um, you know, <laughs> who hasn't? How about this slogan? No to nuclear apocalypse. Yes to arms control. Yeah. You see, because right now there is no arms control. Right. Because of this war, because of this war, right. there is a suspension of the last remaining strategic arms uh, 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 treaty between Russia and the United States. That treaty expires on February 26th, uh, February 2026. When it expires, there will be no arms control treaties. And because of the level of mistrust that currently exists between Russia and the United States today, this will inevitably lead to an arms race without any checks and balances in place. And because human nature is what it is and the level of mistrust it is, it's not that there is a possibility of a miscalculation. It is a distinct probability, which means there will be a nuclear exchange and we all die. This is the point I'm trying to get out to the anti-war movement right now. Um, yeah, this war is screwed up, okay? I think we can all agree on that. This war is screwed up and you may believe this, I may believe that, 
and we're not going to agree. But what we can agree is we don't want this war to turn into a nuclear apocalypse. So let's walk away from this war right. and let's focus on the big picture because we ain't going to solve this war. It's going to solve itself. That's the tragic reality because uh, the U.S. isn't going to stop providing arms and the Russians aren't going to stop killing Ukrainians. And so this war will solve itself. What we need to focus on is getting Russians and Americans back together at the negotiating table. That's our number one priority, not to tell them how the outcome should be. That's prescriptive and that doesn't work. I can tell you as an arms controller, but that you must sit down and start the business of talking now. It takes three to five years to negotiate an effective arms control agreement. We're not going to get that. At best, we're going to get some momentum post-2024 election and have one year, one year, get a treaty done, which means you got to sit down in earnest and you have to mean it and it has to work. You get one shot at this. And that isn't going to happen if you have politicians and arms control experts who uh, remain hostile to that notion. Yeah. They have to be empowered by the people in the same way that the Reagan administration, because remember, study the history of the Reagan administration. Early on, they did not like arms control. Richard Pearl and company were against it. Even Paul Nietzsche, the, the negotiator, wasn't too thrilled about it. Uh, Richard Burt, start yet, didn't like it. Um, and in June of 1982, a million people gathered in Central Park and sent yeah. a message that we support arms control. Mm -hmm. Yes to arms control. And that liberated the politicians. And five years later, we got the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty that then spilled over to the START Treaty, and we began a nice process that now has been reversed. So if people say, I'm anti-war, what can I do? I'm telling you right now, I'll give you a date. June 22nd, 2024. Join me and other people in Central Park or wherever you want to come up. Let's get millions of people to come out that day and send us a send -off. We're not protesting against anything. We're protesting for, we're demonstrating in support of arms control. Because if we don't solve that problem, all this other stuff doesn't matter. None of it matters. And now we come back to one of the original things we talked about. Can the left and the right come together? As an anti-war movement, probably not. Probably isn't going to happen. But as a pro-disarmament movement to save the world, to save humanity, to save their children, to make it possible for their respective causes to have a chance to succeed in succeeding generations, even if you guys don't agree with one so another. We can, now. So we can keep fighting each other even. Keep fighting each other, which is perfect <laughs> in a democracy. That's what makes a democracy work. Right. But in order to give this imperfect democratic system a chance to live and thrive and work in all of its horrific irregularities, we have to be alive. So can we get together on the issue of arms control and send a signal to anybody running for office in the 2024 election that if you don't sign on to a litmus test, it's a simple one. Will you make arms control your number one policy objective if elected? Yes or no? I want you to commit right now. And if the answer is no, then all the millions of people say, we don't vote for you. Yeah. That's as simple. It doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat, if you don't say that. Now, if you say yes, then we have an issue because if let's say a Democrat says yes, a Republican says yes, then the vote's going to split up and whoever else can do the other stuff. But you got to say yes. Right. Got to say yes to arms control. That is a movement I think we can get a lot of people to buy into. Thank you, Scott. Um, so if you're right uh, and this war is over in six to eight months, I'll, I'll we'll talk again then. Go buy me a beer. I'll buy you a beer, and, and also, um, and also, if if you're wrong, then we'll we'll probably I'll buy you a beer. <laughs> yeah, you'll buy me a beer, and we'll talk uh, for uh, your, again, at the end yeah. of year two. Okay, thanks, Scott. Okay, thank you.